This is a very clinical talk. We're going to go run through a number of cases. And here's the first one uh, from the Neurology Consultation Service at my hospital. The story of a 78-year-old woman who was a non-insulin dependent diabetic, and she was admitted for a hyperosmolar state with a very high blood sugar, but not in ketoacidosis. She had previously been treated with metoclopramid for a diabetic gastroparesis, and we were called to see her for what was, what was deemed to be a tardive dyskinesia. Now, it's true, uh, the metoclopramid use uh, antedated the onset of the dyskinesia, and so the dyskinesia was late to um, the use of that drug, true, but it was acute in onset, and it was unilateral, and it was high amplitude, and it was very arrhythmic, uh, just on the right side. Now, before we diagnose this, uh, what do we do? We're neurologists, so we take pictures. And this is a CT scan. Her head is slightly tilted uh, in this scanner, so the CT scan to the left. And what I'm trying to demonstrate in the coronal uh, growth specimen on the right of the screen is where in the left brain uh, her lesion might be uh, from top to bottom. I think you'd agree that there's a spot of blood uh, in the uh, subthalamic area in the left brain. Uh, but before we diagnose this, let's just talk about what I'm trying to engage here. Uh, I'm trying to get us to think about the relationship between uh, cortex and subcortical structures. So the orange arrow here pointing to cortex, the red arrow here pointing to the putamen, then the yellow ar arrow pointing to the external portion of the globus pallidus, the white area to the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. Again, that's the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis, and the blue arrow pointing to the internal portion of the globus pallidus. Now, all these structures, oh, by the way, the GPI, the internal portion, is directly linked to thalamic nuclei in the ventral tier. And in the motor circuit, we're really talking about the ventral anterior and ventral lateral nuclei of thalamus. Now we can talk about the relationship in a more schematic way. So uh, uh, again, reviewing the, uh, the structures that we just talked about, we have cortex, we have the striatum, and specifically the putamen, although the corpus striatum includes the caudate nucleus. Uh, but in the motor circuit, we're mainly talking about the putamen. And then there's the external portion of the globus pallidus, the internal portion of the globus pallidus, the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis, as we discussed, and those thalamic nuclei, VA and VL. And we know that there are pathways, that there are arrows that we can draw on a chalkboard. We'll draw some green ones and some red ones. The green ones represent excitatory pathways, and the red ones represent inhibitory pathways. Green mainly using glutamate as a neurotransmitter, red using GABA as a neurotransmitter. And if you compare these three arrows in a so-called direct pathway to a different pathway that involves more arrows, you can talk about the direct and indirect pathway having a separate in fact, opposite effects on thalamic firing and, in turn, opposite effects on thalamo, uh, thalamocortical drive. Now, these kinds of arrows and discussions about the direct and indirect pathway, which are going to be germane to the discussion of the surgical treatment of Parkinson's disease that you'll hear in a separate talk in this series, that's all fine and good, but there's there's a way to demonstrate that, in fact, we're not just talking about arrows, that you can take a free-moving animal and selectively activate indirect pathway or direct pathway and have an effect, an obvious effect, on, uh, on their uh, voluntary movement. So let's take a look at that. Here's a, uh, a rat in its, uh, in its little green world, and the laser has just turned on his indirect pathway. The laser comes off, he starts to move around a bit, and we'll turn the laser back on, and he stops. So activation of the indirect pathway gives rise to a cessation of movement. And the investigators in this study said, hmm, what if we were to come up with a uh, Parkinsonian mouse and then try to turn on its direct pathway? What would happen then? So here's a Parkinsonian mouse having been given a selective nigral toxin, 6-hydroxydopamine. And when the laser comes on, it activates voluntary movements that otherwise had been suppressed in his Parkinsonism. So we're not just talking about something theoretical, it's something that has been explored actively in ongoing research. So just to review 
there, there's one more pathway uh, to add to our direct and indirect pathway. This pathway involves a direct connection from cortex to the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis under the influence of glutamate, and then a serial excitatory projection to the globus pallidus pars interna, again glutamatergic, with effect on thalamic drive to the cortex. The thalamus will increase, uh, I'm sorry, will decrease in its activity. So the thought had long been that if you studied the effects, the net effects of the hyperdirect, direct, and indirect pathway in, in time, you could say that there's a background inhib inhibition provided by the, the hyperdirect pathway, followed later by an inhibition uh, due to the indirect pathway, so as to allow an increase in signal to noise ratio related to the activity of the direct pathway, which happens in between those two uh, pathway activities. Now, this is a theory or idea about what the basal ganglia do that's been current for about 20 years or so. But in the last couple of years, uh, investigators uh, doing incredible research in um, the study of movement have asked the question, if, is it possible to create, as it were, a kind of grammar of movement? So that if you looked at a, a mouse or a rat rearing and then move, lurching forward in a dive, and then beginning to walk. Is it possible that in these different segments or syllables of movement, you're going to see direct and indirect pathways firing at the same time, alternatively direct pathway firing and with the indirect pathway subsequent to that? Not much discussion about what the role of the hyperdirect pathways in all of this. But the upshot seems to be that it's probably more complicated than the diagram that I showed you in the previous slide. And I think it just gives you a taste of the, the kind of work that um, is going on actively in the study of, uh, of movement. The idea of a grammar of movement to me is just fascinating. But uh, let's get back to our case. We had a lesion of the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis, and based on our wiring diagram here, we can say that there's a loss of excitatory input into the globus pallidus pars interna, and a unopposed activity of the direct pathway, with the effect being that there's an increase in thalamocortical drive. Well, how do we deal with this. We could conceivably in the setting of that subthalamic nuclear lesion with the associated overactivity of the hyperdirect path of the I'm sorry of the direct pathway create a lesion at the level of the globus pallidus pars interna and all this editing that goes on by the basal ganglia goes away. But it's still possible for the cortex to disseminate its motor commands to spinal centers and all the rest. It's a rationale for why uh, lesions of the globus pallidus pars interna have been effective in the treatment not only of things like choreiform disorders or drug-induced uh, drug, drug dyskinesia and Parkinson's disease, but also in dystonias.